Online shopping has never been more popular. It's been steadily increasing in growth over the years, especially in the last couple of years for obvious reasons. In 2020, global e-commerce sales reached $431.6 billion. For context, if you stacked all those dollars one on top of each other, that would almost reach to the International Space Station, which is 248 miles or 400 kilometers above Earth, in case you're wondering. With so much money flying around and so many people using online shopping, over 2 billion people globally, it's no wonder that cyber criminals have seen an opportunity. But there is a way to shop safely online and in general. And in this video, I will teach you how to never get your debit card stolen again. Before we jump into the content, I want to remind you that the new oil is supported by readers and viewers like you. You can help us keep going. In the description, we have a support link and we accept Monero, we accept Bitcoin, we accept regular fiat currencies. There's also a number of affiliate links that you can use that we will get a kickback from if you sign up for any of those services. So please, if you are able to help support the new oil and keep this going, please do. So first up, why care about payment privacy at all? Well, there's the cybercrime angle that I mentioned at the beginning. In 2020, global payments fraud cost $32.39 billion. That's with a B. Global payments fraud refers to the amount of money that was spent unlawfully, usually by stealing a customer's card information. So that means in 2020, $32 billion worth of people's money was spent without their consent. You may think that it's the fault of the companies for failing to protect your card, but to be honest, they try. E-commerce retailers deal with an average of 206,000 web attacks per month. Now, some of these are very simple, unsophisticated, and easy to defend against, but some are fairly complicated and intense. There's also different kinds of attacks. Some people are looking to get into the database and steal card numbers or payment information, while others are trying to, for example, plant malware that would steal your card number while you check out. This, by the way, is known as a mage cart attack, and it is very, very common. I once heard a great piece of advice about this. The defender needs to get it perfect every single time. The attacker only needs to get lucky once. If you think that this is a very niche, specialized thing, know that there were over 76 million stolen card numbers for sale on the dark web at the start of 2020. This is incredibly common. That covers the security sides, but there's also a privacy angle to this stuff. Your bank can see every single transaction that you make with a card. And believe it or not, they sell that information back to data brokers who use it to paint a better picture of you. This is usually used for advertising purposes, but it can be pretty invasive. Consider the following, for example. If you regularly buy gas at the same gas station, it's probably close to your home or your work. And that paints a picture of where you live or work. And based on how much you fill up and how often, that shows how much you drive. Where you buy groceries can help paint a picture of your eating habits. If you go to an all organic store versus the regular local grocery store or even a lot of fast food. For most of us, our paychecks are direct deposited, which means your bank already knows your annual income. And there's other spending habits that describe more about you. How often you go to concerts, what kind of concerts you go to, what kind of movies you buy tickets for, the games that you buy or the streaming services you subscribe to, especially if they're really niche ones like Shudder, for example, which is a streaming service specializing in horror movies and horror shows. So this stuff can get pretty granular and reveal a lot more about you than you might think. This is pure speculation on my end, but I think that someday we're going to see a future where this kind of data is used to help calculate things like health insurance rates or life insurance eligibility. We're already living in an age where companies are openly using your cell phone location data to track your driving habits. Why not this stuff? I don't have any proof that that's gonna happen, but honestly, I do think it is coming. A lot of this stuff is completely invisible to you, like mage cart skimming and the sale of your data, and it seems almost impossible to defend against. So how can you make sure that you stay in control of your data? Tip number one, use cash. Some people say that cash is dead, but statistics beg otherwise. One in five consumers still prefer cash over card. One in 10 make all of their purchases with cash and a whopping 88% of consumers use cash quote at least sometimes. ATM withdrawals are also declining in number, but increasing in the value. In other words, people are withdrawing money less often, but when they do, they're withdrawing more money at a time. 
pro tip, by the way, if you're gonna start paying in cash, figure out how much money you need each pay period and take that out of the ATM all at once. This way it helps to create a smaller profile. Again, you go to the ATM and you withdraw $800, but they can't see where you spent it. And this creates a smaller profile as opposed to say, taking out $100 here, $20 there. If you calculate how much you need and take it all out at once, you're creating a very small pattern. The pattern might be that you go to the same ATM every two weeks, but that's about it. Other studies have found that if you use cash, it helps you stick to your budget and that paying with cash physically hurts you more than paying with card. Physically parting with cash actually triggers the same neurons in your brain that pain would, obviously on a much lesser scale, but it still hurts and that helps you save money. A lot of people are worried about paying in cash because they think that they're more likely to get robbed. But as long as you're not flashing your cash around obnoxiously, there's really no way for criminals to know how much you're packing. I hope they can make change for a fortune. In fact, while researching for this video, I was unable to find any studies that said that carrying cash made you a bigger target for robbery. The only study I found that even addressed the issue said that at best it was uncertain. Now, I do wanna be fair, cash does have its drawbacks. You have to keep good records of your purchases because the bank isn't doing it for you anymore. This could be as simple as keeping all your receipts or you could just make a note on your phone or carry a little notebook and make a note every time you spend money, where you spent it, how much, etc. If you choose to pay larger bills, like your utility bills in cash, this could also mean that you have to go out of your way. You have to stand in line, you can only do it during certain business hours, etc. However, for maximum privacy, there is almost nothing as invisible as cash. Tip number two, use virtual cards. So what happens when you wanna buy something online or you are otherwise in a position where cash is not available? Virtual cards. On my website, I list several services that issue digital debit cards or prepaid cards that you can use to pay for online purchases. Many of them, but not all, will even allow you to put in fake information to further maintain your privacy. Pro tip. Don't use John Smith at 123 Main Street for your information. In my experience, this will almost always result in a fraud alert being placed on your account, and then you're unable to purchase the item because they want you to prove that you're legitimate and that it's not a fraud, but you can't prove it because you're not John Smith living at 123 Main Street. Instead, I recommend picking the address of a local hotel or maybe a large apartment complex without a unit number and use that as the billing address. Use your PO box, which I will talk about in another video, for your shipping address and then use a random name generator to come up with a generic but realistic sounding name. Personally, I've never had issues using this strategy. My preferred virtual card provider is privacy.com. If you choose to go with them, I have an affiliate link that I will include in the show notes and also on my website, as well as a standard non-affiliate link. Using this link to sign up will give me a small credit on my account, so basically free money because I use privacy.com quite generously. Some other good services that I've had personal experience with include MySudo and Abin Blur, but of course you should pick whatever is right for you. I have a list of providers on my website and there are others out there probably that I'm not aware of. Now, an important note for the more privacy conscious among us, all of these companies are legal entities who comply with know your customer laws to the extent required. None of these services will provide you with anonymous cards. All of them will require identifying information like your real name, your date of birth, your social security number. So if you are looking for a completely anonymous solution, this is not for you. This is strictly to protect you from data breaches and automated data scraping for marketing profiles and data brokers. There is also one other source of virtual cards that might surprise you, and that might be your bank. At the time of this recording, four of the top five banks in the US offer virtual cards, and those are JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup. The last fifth bank, Bancorp, offers prepaid cards under certain conditions. I know this isn't a personal finance video, but real quick, if you're a Wells Fargo customer, please leave them. They are absolutely terrible. I'm not gonna get into it in this video, but just go to your favorite privacy respecting search engine, look up Wells Fargo scandals. They've got a whole list of them as long as my arm. Like even for a big bank, they're exceptionally terrible. Your best bet is usually going to be a local credit union. That's usually where you're gonna get the best rates and the best customer service. But as always, do your own research. Getting back on topic, let's talk about tip number three, which is prepaid cards. Some of you watching this may live in areas that are not serviced by virtual card providers. Your bank may not offer this service, or you may be in a situation where you can't pay with cash, but you need to pay in person. In this case, your best bet is a prepaid card. 
Prepaid vanilla cards are extremely popular, but your results may vary. I've heard a lot of stories of these cards requiring you to register them online and demanding varying levels of information. So depending on this stuff, it may not be right for everyone, but if you can get away with using it without too much difficulty, buying one of these in cash and then using it instead of your debit card would be a really good defense. In some cases, using a vendor specific gift card may be a good route like Apple, Amazon, or Steam. Again, these are not gonna provide much privacy from the data brokers themselves, especially if you're topping up an account that you use frequently. For example, if you top up your Netflix account with a gift card every few months, there is still the pattern of usage, the shows that you watch and the times you watch and stuff like that. But again, it will protect you against data breaches and rogue employees. On that note, let me give a real quick tip on how I've been able to use Amazon pseudo anonymously. Amazon is really popular and I see this question a lot. My first piece of advice would be don't. Amazon is a downright evil company and I don't care what your political opinions are or what your ethical opinions are. Chances are I can find a reason that you would agree with that Amazon is an evil company and you should stop using them. Having said that, I understand that sometimes there are items that you literally cannot find anywhere except Amazon or they are so outrageously expensive everywhere else. So here's what's worked for me. Caution, results may vary. I've heard some of these techniques not work for everyone, so be careful. Start off by creating a new email address. In the past, I have gotten away with using a regular alias.com or anonaddy.me from Simple Login and Anonaddy. However, a lot of people recently have reported having trouble with that. Instead, you'll probably have better luck using a Gmail or ProtonMail or Tutanota, something like that. Or if you have a custom domain, you could even use that. They will probably ask for phone number. Again, in my experience, a voice over IP number has always been fine. That's another video we'll get to, but you may have to go out and buy a trial SIM card like Mint Mobile or something. Second, a lot of people report having better success without using a VPN. VPNs are something we'll talk about in a later video. A lot of people may not want to connect to Amazon directly from home without a VPN for obvious reasons as Amazon is an incredibly data hungry company. So the way around this is to go to a public space like a library or McDonald's or Starbucks and use their public Wi-Fi. Third, pay for a gift card in cash and apply it to that account. Now, this is the step where I especially encourage you to be careful. I've heard of people getting locked out at this stage. And that means if you just dropped a hundred dollars on an Amazon gift card, you're out a hundred dollars. So maybe start small with like $25 and see how it goes. Finally, ship it to an Amazon locker instead of your home. These are incredibly common nowadays. Sometimes they're even in gas stations. They're all over the place. I have used this trick several times and personally have never had any issues. But again, your mileage may vary. Start off with a very low cost investment and go from there. Last but not least, let's talk about cryptocurrency. I know that if I don't talk about it, I'm gonna have hordes of people contacting me or leaving comments and saying, you didn't mention cryptocurrency. You didn't mention cryptocurrency. Everything that I am about to say is personal opinion. You can take it, you can leave it, I don't care. Let me start off by saying I like the idea of cryptocurrency. I really like the idea of a decentralized, open source, transparent digital currency that takes power away from banks and governments and gives it to the ordinary everyday consumer with a degree of privacy and control. Having said that, I personally believe that 95% of the cryptocurrencies out there are absolute trash. Either they're useless and designed to trap you in somebody's alternative tech ecosystem for no reason, or they're just a pump and dump scam designed to get somebody rich. In my opinion, there are only a very small handful of cryptocurrencies that are serving a useful purpose and they're actually trying to solve a real problem. Second, I do not believe cryptocurrency is a quote unquote investment. I don't think you should buy cryptocurrency expecting to get rich. It might happen, it might not. What you're really doing is gambling. Right now, cryptocurrency is extremely volatile. And I think if you buy it with the expectation of getting rich, you're gambling. Right now, most personal finance experts say that if you're gonna get into cryptocurrency, you should only put about 5% of your net worth into it. So again, I'm not saying avoid it. I'm saying keep your expectations in check. Know what it's for, know why you're buying it. Don't buy it just because everybody's talking about it and don't buy it because you think you're gonna get rich overnight because you're probably gonna be really disappointed if those are your motivations. Having said all that, cryptocurrency does have legitimate uses. I've met people who live in financially unstable countries where banking is not readily available to most citizens. And for them, things like Bitcoin and Ethereum are a great way to pay and send each other money. They have their uses. 
But for most of the Western world who lives in an area where the fiat currencies are stable and the places that you can actually spend your cryptocurrency are few and far between, it's more of a novelty and a toy. Now, getting back to privacy specifically, there's another big misconception about cryptocurrency and it's not all of them are private. Bitcoin, for example, is actually not very private. Right now, the only coin that I truly believe is private is Monero. And to be honest, the main reason I believe that is because the IRS is offering an amazingly high reward for anyone who can crack it, which to me tells me that they haven't been able to trace it and they're very interested in it. Zcash is also touted as a privacy coin, but I've heard a lot of debate about that. Maybe someone smarter than me can weigh in on that one. Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, etc. To my knowledge, none of those should be considered private. Cryptocurrency could be an entire video in and of itself. It could be an entire series. There are whole websites and newsletters and podcasts out there dedicated to cryptocurrency. So if you are looking to privately get your hands on some cryptocurrency, there's a whole rabbit hole that you need to get into that I am not going to cover. However, I will point you towards a resource that I trust when it comes to that stuff. And that is Seth from Opt Out Podcast. In the show notes, I will leave a couple of his episodes that have directly addressed cryptocurrency and they offer some advice on how to get started and how to acquire some anonymously. He's really passionate about this stuff. He's a really smart guy. He's been plugged into the Monero community for years, so he really knows what he's talking about. If you're interested in learning more about cryptocurrency, I highly recommend you check out what he has to say because he knows more than I do. And as a bonus, he has a very practical approach to it that I think is very approachable for a lot of people. Before I close out, I want to remind you that the new oil is community supported. Please donate to us if you are able to. You may notice, as I said, we do accept cryptocurrencies. Like I said, I don't think they're all bad and I don't think there's an issue with using them. Just keep your expectations in check. Some of the services that we use do accept cryptocurrency payments. That's one of the reasons that we're willing to take cryptocurrencies. And again, there are ways to use them anonymously. You just have to know how to do that. So before you donate in cryptocurrency, I recommend you go check out Opt Out Podcast and then come back. So remember, the best ways to protect yourself in order, cash, virtual cards, prepaid cards, and cryptocurrency if you do it right. Remember to tread lightly with that last one, but make generous use of the first one whenever possible. For more information about payment masking and to see some of the different virtual card services that I recommend, check out thenewoil.org.